Hi, I'm Sam Routledge, Solutions Director and Chief Geek at Softcat. Um, I'm here at the Two Brewers pub in Marlow with Joe Bagley, who's uh, VMware's EMEA CTO, also a uh, fireworks expert and purveyor of the finest analogies known to man of technological concepts. Um, we're in the pub, the, the Two Brewers in Marlow, lovely little pub, does good food by the way, um, because it serves beer that is brewed within about 50 yards of Joe's house, as he's fortunately for us, he's a, he's a, he's a local boy, same as me. Sadly um, not close enough for me to have a pipe fitted, apparently, I have asked. I that would that would be good. awesome. Yeah. Beer as a service, exactly. perhaps. Exactly, just a yeah. tap in my ear. That, that'd be quality. <laughs> and we're going to have a chat about VMware's NSX and the world of software-defined networking and kind of what that market looks like. Oh, I thought we were here for a beard off, but I obviously lost that. But yeah, I suppose so, so. Let's talk about NSX. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, let's <laughs> crack on then. Presumably, by now, you've virtualized every server in the known universe. Pretty much. I think when it comes to the terms of market penetration, we're, we're, we're pretty much there, which is kind of interesting because that gives us a challenge because when you've yeah. virtualized every server... What do you virtualize now? <laughs> so so you so guess that's the point of NSX, right? Let's go virtualize uh, something else. Yeah, I think the interesting thing, though, is we didn't... Uh, people look at it and go, well, exactly that. Well, so you, you virtualize all the servers, so you've got to look what else to virtualize. <laughs> exactly. So network next. It, it, it definitely wasn't like that. It was very much that we're trying to build what I call a sort of operating system for data centers, which okay. is you know, branded yeah. as software-defined data yeah. center. Yeah. And to achieve that, you have to have virtualized networking and virtualized storage. Yeah. So that kind of leads into NSX and, and vSAN yeah. as well. So you know, they're natural logical next steps in building a distributed operating system and, and, and proper scalable multi-data center cloud. So Are you seeing NSX used in any specific scenarios? It's actually quite weird. We, um, when we were first looking at NSX, it was an obvious solution to our problem of, you know, how do we free VMs up from being stuck in any particular physical location and, yeah. and allow for some of the things we wanted to do. Um, and then very early on, we sort of discovered this thread of micro segmentation, as it's yeah. now been called, yeah. which is, I, it, people call it having a firewall per VM. That's actually the wrong term, but I mean, it's, it's in essence what you're doing is, is yeah. having. Uh, security at the VM level individually configured in, in a very easy scalable way and it, what was really funny was um, you know we deal a lot with security agencies governments as you yeah. can expect and you know our software is running some very very impressive stuff around the world and I thought the hardest people to sell networking in software to would be government guys. Yeah, you know? you'd, you'd have thought so. Wouldn't yeah you? you know they're like oh it's got to be physical physical yeah. secure. Do you know what once they kind of had that aha moment about the potential of it that was our sort of you know main thread. And, yeah, you know, yeah. If anything, I'd, I'd caution people about you know focusing on the micro segmentation too much. I think a lot of people have kind of gone at that and got NSX is for micro segmentation, and it, that was an amazing story. And, and a lot yeah. of people looking at that. But it's really, only one use case of many. It's, it's, it's one of many many use cases. I think that the real the real big one now that we're seeing you know real value for our customers in is in exactly that building flexible IaaS clouds. Yeah. But one that we recently demonstrated at VMworld was the ability to extend your private network into public clouds. Right, and I think okay. that's actually really, really powerful. And is that specifically your public cloud, i.e. Cloud Air, or is that any public cloud? Uh, any. I mean, one yeah. of the things we demonstrated at, um, at VMworld last year was extending Guido, uh, demonstrated extending into AWS. Okay. So it's, it's not very much about into vCloud Air. I mean, the vCloud Air network actually is probably more important than vCloud yeah. Air, which is you know, thousands of people running our software, yeah. including you know, all manner of different companies and yeah. providers. Yeah. But I think it's more understanding that as we go forward, it's going to be a multi-cloud world. Yeah. What does that mean culturally for an IT department? Because clearly you've got VI admins and storage guys and died in the wall network CCIE type chappies. And if you're doing all this stuff in software, doesn't that kind of merge? It, this is the whole point. I think, you know, when you look back at the, the 90s and the early part of this century, yeah. what, what you had was, that you're right, there's sort of very, very clearly defined network, storage, yeah, yeah. compute, etc. But now when you're building a combined cloud where people are coming to self-serve, yeah. even automated serve by API, you know, a combination of those, you've got to have a, a federated approach within your yeah. IT department. So I'm seeing... A lot of people suddenly realise that you know their previous domains of expertise are having to expand. Yeah. Now that yeah. there's there's two ways to look at that, and I think a lot of people see it as career threatening, and I think that's the wrong yeah. way to look at it. Yeah. So what what advice would you give somebody who is in one of those silos as to how they take their career forward? <laughs> I mean, is it as obvious as if you're a network guy, learn a bit about server virtualization and a bit about the storage layer, or does it go deeper than that? No, I think it pretty much is that. I mean, it, it's really quite, 
Um, interesting. I had a very a varied and peripatetic early part of my career. Where it's I a fine was, word. Peripatetic's awesome. Yeah. For our audience, that means wandering around. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. Um, where I was, you know, one minute I'm uh, an admin of IP addresses for the yeah. whole of HP Europe, and then the next minute I'm, you know, architecting an NT rollout, the next minute I'm deep in networking. Yeah. And that gave me quite a broad mix of a base. I think I'd encourage other people to do similar, because nowadays, you can't really go and build a cloud unless you have an understanding of, of networking. All of the components therein, yeah. But you're never going to get someone that knows all of that. So actually what I'm seeing is people building really good cross-discipline functional teams. So you're okay. getting a team of people where there is a guy who's really good at networking. Yeah, so he'd be the network lead, but he'd know enough about the other bits. That has understanding about a combined goal. And, and it's all about how people are, are gold and measured, and this is really interesting. I remember I had a customer many years ago, I went there to hold, help them out when I was at another software company, and um, I was introduced into their IT department and taken into their war room. And I said, like, what's okay. the war room for? And they said, well, this is the room where we have arguments when you know, everything goes wrong. And you're like, I mean, hell, are you that badly organized? <laughs> you have a dedicated room in your IT department for having arguments in. And I think that was a culture where you had the networking guy. So yeah. let's just say you're, you're running a website, yeah. for example, and the website's gone down. You have a nice meeting, you all go in the war room, and the network guy goes, well, the network's fine, not yeah. my problem, bye. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think you've got that kind of culture a lot in a lot of organizations. Yeah, I think you're right. You, know, you break that down now and you go, okay, well, network guy, you're no longer just gold on the fact that the network works and you've got yeah. enough bandwidth, but you're now also gold on the availability of the website. Yeah as is everyone else in your team. Yeah, so you're incentivized to work together right. to, to make that happen. And yeah. that's the change I'm seeing good IT leaders drive down through their organizations, yeah. is, is looking at people at being gold around delivering the service or the application, yeah. not the yeah. component. That makes sense, I think that, that, that's, that's really good insight. What about the marketplace for software-defined networking generally? I mean, clearly you've got your approach, which is to get it into, into software and into the hypervisor. How, how does that play with the hardware vendors? Are there different approaches to, to software-defined networking? Yeah, I wouldn't say it was necessarily our approach. It's more the, the approach of the industry generally. Right. You know, you look at our technology is actually a fundamental part of the open source project OpenStack, yeah. you know, which is going across all, all the different, you know, areas of IT, I suppose. Yeah. But when you actually drill into it, I think it's a general move to doing things in software. If you yeah. want to do things at the speed and scale that people are doing things now, then yeah. you need to have things automated and available to be manipulated in software. You can't get down to you know, physical ASIC-based hardware devices yeah. being the center of your world. I think everyone's realizing that, even you know, some of the network providers are bringing out their own versions of sure. software-defined networking. So it's, it's a general industry trend. I think the important thing about what we're doing with NSX, much like the OpenStack and other, yeah. some of the other approaches, is that we are harbor independent. Yeah. And so if you look at what made VMware so successful on the hypervisor is we yeah. freed people It didn't up. matter which server, yeah. That's exactly it. So now we're saying it doesn't necessarily matter which particular network switch or routing. Yeah. The fun thing is though, much like happened in uh, hardware for server virtualization where people started building specialized Exactly, servers, servers developed specifically for virtualization workloads. Right. You think you'll get the same thing in, in network hardware. Definitely, we're already seeing yeah. it. So we've got people like Brocade, Arista, Palo Alto yeah. Networks and others building features and functions into their physical devices and into the operating systems on those devices to help support integrating better with virtualized overlay networks. So I think people are embracing it rather than sort of you know, resisting it from a hardware perspective. It's almost, you know, if, if I was a networking hardware vendor right now, I'd just be yeah. turning around looking at all the server vendors going, well, what, what did they do? <laughs> and, well, yeah, well, how can I follow that paradigm? Yeah. No, that makes sense. So that, that, that software layer, is this what people t are referring to when they're talking about infrastructure as, a co as code? Yeah, that's one of the, the, the two main buzzwords I hear at the minute are infrastructure as code and DevOps. And, yeah. and is, that, it, is this taking people some way down that path or helping towards it? Definitely. It enables you the automation. So if you look at a traditional organization, we call it, um, you talk about infrastructure as a service. Well, yeah. it actually ends up being tickets as a service, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you yeah. go and you say, I want a new server. And it's like, okay, yeah. well, you need to submit a ticket and then yeah. we'll go and get the networking guys to do their yeah. bit and the storage guys and blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. That's once you've got it through purchasing. Well, correct. And it yeah. may take, and some people go, oh, we get that done in less than an hour. I'm sorry, yeah. even an hour is too slow. People want to be able to have their application yeah. go, I need more resources yeah. and call in software to an API to say, spin up some more resources. Yeah. And if that's allowed based on policy and the, and the, and the cost allowed, yeah. then it'll happen. Um, that's infrastructure as code. Yeah. Um, now, necessarily, you could probably do that by automating hardware-based stuff. Yeah. And that's essentially what we're doing. We're, yeah. putting, a, we're yeah. putting a universal layer Absolutely. across yeah. all the hardware that automates that. Yeah. So yeah, entirely, that's what infrastructure as code is. Yeah. 
<laughs> and we've got a particular example of that with one of our customers that, that we deployed NSX for. They, were, they had um, t two data centers and they wanted to be able to move workloads backwards and forwards and they could move the storage and move the VM back, back and forth quite comfortably. Mm -hmm. But it would take two days for the network to, to be provisioned. Yeah. Now they can do the whole thing in you know, a couple of minutes really. So I mentioned at the beginning of, the, uh, of, of this video that you're known in the industry for your crazy analogies of, and interesting <laughs> things. So I'd kind of like to finish with you describing what NSX does and is with one of your amazing technological analogies. So one of the ones that I really like around micro segmentation yeah. is uh, people talk about the hotel model, yeah. where if you think about how a data center is secured today, it's much like a hotel that only had a security guard on the front door, right. and all the hotel rooms had no keys or locks on them. Okay. So you know, it doesn't sound like a particularly sensible idea, because of course once you're in the hotel, you can take whatever you like. That's traditional architecture, right? So, so the fun thing is that if, if you look at that, your security guard on the front door is your, is your firewall on yeah. your data center. Now some people go, oh, we've got segmentation by network. Yeah, okay, so you've got a firewall per floor, yeah. right? So you've yeah. got a security guard per floor going, are you allowed on the fourth floor? Yeah. Yeah, once anyone's in the fourth floor, they're done. So, yeah, once again. You know, whereas if you look at NSX, that literally is a key on every door, yeah. an electronic key on every door yeah. that can be dynamically allocated to whoever you want to to have access yeah. to that room. It's that simple. But the hotels do that because it is incredibly good for them from a cost perspective and it gives great functionality for their users. Yeah. And that's exactly what you're looking at with NSX. So that's a great one in terms of micro segmentation, I suppose. If people are trying to understand what does that mean, yeah. it's exactly that model. It's good. I like it. Thank you. So thanks, Joe. That was really um, insightful and really useful. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, if you've got any questions that come out of that, please visit us at softcat.com or give a shout to your Softcat account manager. Actually, I've got a question. Okay. We've sat in a pub now for about 15, 20 minutes. That's a good point. Still don't have a it's 11 o'clock. Can we go? Bar's open. Let's go. Cheers.